A paper thin wall sized television. A car that runs on processed seawater. An army of robotic soldiers. Outer space luxury resorts. And human cyborgs. No, it's not a movie. Buckle up as we race into the near future to see where fantasy becomes fact. Now. Future take off modern marvels. Welcome to the year 2060. As you'll notice, the world has changed quite dramatically in the past 50 years. Several things are bigger. World's tallest skyscraper, one half mile in height. But most things are smaller. Nanotech medicines cure all forms of cancer. Some things are faster. Hypersonic flight from New York to Tokyo takes two hours. While other things last longer. Average human lifespan, 125 years. Of course, these are just predictions. Will they ever be reality? What technologies today will revolutionize tomorrow's personal transportation? Bionics, warfare, home entertainment, and space exploration. And why bother even trying to predict what's coming? Forecasting the future is very important at a couple of levels. If you can't anticipate what's going to happen, you're going to be stuck reacting to what's happening. A good place to start on your road trip into the future is on the road. What will tomorrow's wheels be like? How about a vehicle that uses the most abundant element in the universe as a fuel? Its only emissions are water vapor and a little heat. It's twice as efficient as today's combustion engines, and you can refuel the vehicle at home. No fantasy. Just such test vehicles are already on the road. Get ready for the hydrogen revolution. The hydrogen fuel cell vehicle is going to do to today's cars and trucks what today's cars and trucks did to the horse and buggy of 100, 150 years ago. It is a completely revolutionary approach to automotive transportation. Right now, nearly every major automobile manufacturer in the world is working on hydrogen fuel cell technology. The technology that could begin to supplant gas burning vehicles in the next 15 to 30 years. A fuel cell vehicle essentially is an electric vehicle, but instead of using a battery to provide the power, it, it uses a fuel cell to generate electricity on board. These are very high performance cars. They have great get up and go, wonderful acceleration, and really good driving performance. This is General Motors Hydrogen 3 vehicle. This is not a conventional vehicle, but a fuel cell vehicle powered by hydrogen. The hydrogen stored in the back where the gas tank would normally be. And under the hood is a fuel cell. Now the fuel cell system combines hydrogen and oxygen to make electricity, which powers the vehicle. The waste product is water, which goes out the tailpipe, and heat, which is thrown overboard in the radiator. A fuel cell will continue to produce electricity as long as oxygen and hydrogen are supplied. Fuel cells are different from batteries in this respect. Batteries are self-contained and eventually run down if not recharged. A common type of fuel cell uses a proton exchange membrane, which is sandwiched between two electrodes. Hydrogen gas is fed to one side, while oxygen is fed to the other. The hydrogen atoms are attracted to the oxygen atoms but the membrane only allows the positively charged hydrogen protons through. The electrons have to take the long way around. This flow of electrons generates an electrical current. Although the basic concept of fuel cells dates back to the 1890s, it wasn't until the 1960s that fuel cell technology really took off. Five, four, three, two, one. NASA, looking 
looking for an alternative to heavy batteries, used fuel cells on the Gemini missions, and later on the moon missions, and eventually on the space shuttle missions. One side benefit, the byproduct of the fuel cell is drinkable water. But back on the ground, this car can go 96 miles an hour and performs like a conventional minivan. It's impressive, but engineers still have several technical speed bumps to overcome before you're kicking the tires of your new fuel cell vehicle. The challenges that confront us right now are onboard storage of hydrogen. How much hydrogen can you store on board a vehicle to give it the range that it needs? We have to lower component costs so this vehicle is more affordable. A robust national refueling infrastructure is also extremely critical. Hydrogen can be produced from diverse sources, including coal and natural gas. Hydrogen can even be produced by electrolysis, passing an electric current through water to break its molecules apart into hydrogen and oxygen gas. It could be what frees the country from dependence on foreign oil. But today, hydrogen production isn't as green as it might seem. Right now, most commercially produced hydrogen comes from natural gas. If fossil fuels are used in the production of hydrogen and the process generates air pollutants, we're perhaps no better off. That's why the goal of many environmentally conscious researchers is eventually to produce hydrogen entirely from renewable sources. Renewable sources include wind energy, solar energy, geothermal, uh, ways of making electricity. And of course, that electricity then can be used to produce hydrogen from water. Another challenge is building a hydrogen infrastructure from the ground up. California Governor Arnold Schwarzenegger believes he has the answer. I will sign an executive order creating a public and private partnership that will create hydrogen highways all over the state of California by the year 2010. Governor Schwarzenegger's plan for a hydrogen highway calls for 150 to 200 hydrogen refueling stations strategically placed along California's highways. stations along major highways will be essential for long-distance travel. But for most in-town commuters, Honda has a plan to make filling up even easier. As easy as a trip to your garage. Honda's home energy station connects to a home's natural gas line and is capable of producing hydrogen for fuel cell vehicles. A stationary fuel cell could even power the house. Although there are test vehicles on the road and several infrastructure plans in progress, it'll still be a while before you can fuel your car with hydrogen. Fuel cells are still extremely expensive. If a hydrogen fuel cell car was for sale today, it'd probably cost hundreds of thousands of dollars. Time and technological breakthroughs will bring prices down but it could take 15 to 30 years before practical and affordable hydrogen fuel cell vehicles are available to the public. Hopefully, the promise of a hydrogen economy is worth the wait. The idea of being able to have pollution-free driving and, in fact, have a diverse source of hydrogen, I think, is, is pretty damn exciting, and I think uh, uh, people would love that. Now, unfortunately, doesn't help you with the congestion. So you wouldn't be able to go faster anywhere. That's when a future flying car would really come in handy. Right now you have three different kinds of vehicles. You've got a car that goes along the ground. You've got an airplane that takes you from point to point. And then you've got these huge government finance things that take us up into space. The future brings us the convergence of those three vehicles into one. A car, plane, spaceship. That could reduce a commute from Boston to New York City from four hours to 45 minutes. So how do 
do we get the wheels of technology turning? Well, the real issue is how do we get rid of the wheel? <laughs> because the wheel is a cause of tremendous friction. With nanotechnology, one of the things that we may be able to do is get rid of pavement by implanting the maglev repulsion wires in the grass and turn our highways into grass. Every car will be networked. Vehicles will run on automatic pilot, allowing cars to travel closer together and at incredible speeds. So say goodbye to speeding tickets and traffic accidents. In the future, there's no such thing as speed limit. Like the car of tomorrow, in the future, many things will think for themselves, including robot war fighters. Like it or not, the machines are coming. Forecasting the future isn't easy. In 1943, aviation writer Harry Bruno predicted the decline of the automobile after World War II. Instead of a car in every garage, there will be a helicopter. Future Tech will return on Modern Marvels. The history of warfare is shown that the force with the greatest technological advantage usually wins. Now the U.S. military is working on what could lead to the most deadly weapon on the battlefield by 2025. Robart 3. Welcome to the future. Okay, so the research prototype looks more like the Jetsons made than the Terminator. But don't let his calm exterior fool you. His robotic offspring could one day roam the battlefield, hunting down enemies, and yes, killing them. The Pentagon is spending billions of dollars in the pursuit of robotic technology that will one day lead to autonomous warfighters. In the military, we're specifically looking for things that uh, are dangerous or boring or hazardous to the human, and we try to uh, let the robotic system take over in those areas. The main advantage of the robot is it saves lives. And it's also a force multiplier. But it doesn't get emotional. It doesn't panic and uh, pull the trigger because it's afraid. It's more cold and calculating, and in that sense, hopefully, more able to make the right decision. Robart 3 is the product of 25 years of research. He's an autonomous research prototype developed at the Space and Naval Warfare Systems Center in San Diego, California. With various sensors, he's the first robot to be able to detect a potential threat, search and destroy mission. assess the threat, seeking primary target vulnerability, target lock acquired, commence firing, and respond to the threat. For this demonstration, the threat happens to be a soda can. Commencing search for secondary target. But future tactical autonomous combatants, or TACs, will handle real weapons and real threats. The issue, basically, of a robot equipped with a weapon is somewhat controversial. Our current strategy right now is to maintain a human in the loop at all times, to monitor um, the actions of the robot and make the final decision as to whether or not that truly is a combatant before you take action. When we talk about robots, people like to think of automatons. They like to think of bipedal, two-legged, two-armed, uh, one-head kind of thing, something like Schwarzenegger in the uh, Terminator. We think robots could be very small. They could look like insects. They could look like trucks. They could look like airplanes. Hundreds of teleoperated machines are already serving in Iraq and Afghanistan, checking bunkers, searching buildings, and digging up roadside bombs. However helpful, these machines are remotely controlled, each by at least one soldier. The goal is to make autonomous machines, TACs, capable of thinking for themselves. Today, researchers are working on complex algorithms 
that will help machines make decisions. Define targets, discern friend from foe, and navigate unknown terrain. The robot obviously can do things that the human can't do. Uh, there will always be some things that a human can do better than a robot. By putting them together in a team, you can send uh, the robot in to do the dangerous stuff. One autonomous robot already in service is the Mobile Detection Assessment and Response System. MDARS. This is the MDARS exterior robot. It's an autonomous security robot which patrols around fixed site installations in the continental United States, uh, patrols perimeters, randomly patrols. There's no human operator driving this machine. It basically runs by itself. It navigates using the Novatail RT2 system, which is good to accuracies of about two centimeters. Uh, we have a number of application payloads that go on here. This is a remotely operated weapon. This is a non-lethal replica of the weapon in here now. Uh, you can remove this cradle here and drop in the actual weapon, which looks just like this. We have a number of systems on here for collision avoidance. Basically what that means is they're looking out ahead of the system to be sure there's nothing in the way. We have a marsupial carrier on the back, which has a uh, ERBOT man portable robot in it. This allows this diesel-powered system to uh, carry this robot down to a point and release it uh, where it can go into places this system can't fit. Underground, uh, in culverts, bunkers, tunnels, inside of buildings. It allows us to put a sensor pretty much anywhere we want to. The robots on the battlefield will serve roles from pack animal to protector. But they will all be connected, sharing information with each other. One urban warfare scenario is to have automatic cannons protecting troops occupying a hostile city. When an enemy fires on U.S. troops, the humans take cover. But these robots, which are linked, triangulate where the shot came from and instantaneously return fire. Insurgent fires a, a shot. Before that insurgent can drop his rifle and run, a grenade is coming through the window. So you, you effectively made the insurgent pay a very high price for messing with anybody with a robot. But what happens if one short circuits? What happens when armed robots become smart enough and decide we're no longer useful and start decommissioning us? Is that just science fiction? Science fiction does precede science fact. 20 to 30 years from now, we will have the ability to mimic the human brain. Whether we'll be able to put the intelligence and the ability to discern friend from foe, that's going to be the real question. Humans can't do it right now, so how do we expect robots who would imitate human intelligence to do it? It's going to be a real challenge, and many people are very afraid of sentient robots. We envision that the machines will be working with humans, they'll be supervised and not left to their own devices 100% uh, of the time. There are several technological challenges to overcome before the armed autonomous robot warfighter hits the battlefield. But don't fool yourself. The machines are coming. The question again is not a matter of if we'll have this, it's a question of when. And we are inexorably marching technologically toward that. Target lock acquired. Commence firing. The word robot was introduced in 1920 by the Czech playwright Karl Čapek from the Czech word for forced labor. In his play, intelligent robots turn on their human owners and take over the world. Future Tech will return on Modern Marvels. With the development of nanotechnology, scientists plan to do great things in the future. Cure cancer, help feed the starving, and of course, Build a kickin' home entertainment system. Televisions in the future will shrink as small as your retina and grow as big as your house. Instead of your television being in your living room, your living room is going to be in your television. We are now at the point where materials are being invented that can serve as 
television screens, no matter how large or small they are. So we will be painting or rolling up screens across walls, floors, and ceilings. You will be able to walk on them, you will be able to hang pictures on them, but you won't actually have to do that anymore because the pictures will actually be projected as part of the screen. So when you walk into your room, you will actually be able to walk into a completely different room if you want to program it that way. And that's going to be the big change. Television was formally announced at the 1939 World's Fair in New York. In the next half century, people will see as well as hear around the world. Newspapers, magazines, mail and messages will be sent through the air at lightning speed and reproduced in the home. Today, several companies are working on technologies for the next generation of televisions. Super thin and even flexible electronic screens. Organic light emitting diode, OLED technology, might lead to bigger, brighter, thinner, and more colorful displays than even LCDs in the future. OLEDs work by sandwiching organic material between two electrodes. When electricity flows through the organic material, it glows. Several companies have test models. This 13-inch Philips prototype is only one millimeter thick. The Universal Display Corporation is even working on flexible OLED technology, using pliable substrates, such as plastic film. or thin, bendable, metallic foil. Imagine one day rolling up your 20-inch computer monitor and throwing it in your backpack. Television is uh, basically now constrained to a small rectangle on your wall or in your, on your shelf. The television of the future is unlimited in where it can be. The television of the future is basically uh, able to move to a personal television. TV and video monitors will be on everything in the future. Nanotech materials might turn entire buildings into moving billboards. What's happening right now is that we see painted surfaces being developed, where you actually have a liquid that can be painted onto a very thin substrate over very broad areas. And that's the real revolution that's taking place. That's where nanotechnology is having a huge impact because you're getting these very, very tiny pixel-like nano-sized particles that are being included in this liquid that then solidifies to form essentially a television screen over a very wide surface. So you can now actually not be limited by flat surfaces or by size. But video screens of the future won't only be the size of buildings. They'll also be so well concealed, no one will even know you're watching television. The television has another application that we're even actually beginning to see right now, and it's known as optobionics. This is where thousands and thousands of tiny computer chips are implanted in the back of the retina and are connected directly to the optical nerve leading to the brain. Today, several research groups are working on retinal microchip implantation to improve vision, not television. The Optobionics Corporation is developing a retinal microchip implant for people with age-related macular degeneration and other eye conditions. The microchip implanted on the back of the eye contains 5,000 microscopic solar cells that convert the light energy from images into electrical chemical impulses that stimulate the remaining functional cells. Clinical trials began in 2000. So far, none of the patients has rejected the implants, and all have reported improved vision. The Retina TV might be next, so stay tuned.
In the brave future, even the remote control might become a thing of the past. Next, a cerebral implant could make changing the channel as easy as changing your mind. In 1946, 20th Century Fox movie executive Daryl Zanuck predicted TV wouldn't last six months after its introduction. He said, people will get tired of staring at a plywood box every night. Future Tech will return on Modern Marvels. Ever want to control something telekinetically? In the future, you might be able to. Brain-machine interfaces, including cerebral implants, will soon merge microchip and mortal to create a true bionic man with seemingly telekinetic powers. A lot of people have this image that, uh, basically from Hollywood, that the machines are coming. Well, the machines are coming, and they are us. Because what we see happening is a marriage between the computer electronic world and the human brain world. But do scientists have the technology? Do scientists have the capability to make the first bionic men and women? The answer is yes. And they're already here. Scientists around the world are currently working on brain-machine interfaces, BMIs. These devices facilitate direct communication between the brain and the computer. For the severely disabled, it's a way to control the computer without using a mouse or keyboard. Andrew Junker of Brain Actuated Technologies invented Brain Fingers, which is a BMI that can be used for communicating, to surf the web, or to control a computer-equipped house. It can also control off-the-shelf software. This is the CyberLink Brain Fingers system. It consists of a headband, that plugs into an interface box which goes into the computer. The way I connect, I wear this headband that has three sensors that will pick up the voltage at my forehead. Brain cells communicate by producing tiny electrical impulses. Brain fingers can detect and decode some of these impulses. The signals are broken into frequencies Andrew calls brain fingers. So we could use that signal, for example, to control or create a switch. What's shown in this display is that muscle signal as it moves across the screen. And in the simplest case, if I raise an eyebrow quickly, I have a switch. You notice that when I go up, switch comes on. Up, switch one on. Mapping these electrical impulses to computer commands allows a user to control the machine. For instance, a user can tell the computer a quick glance right moves the cursor right, and raising an eyebrow moves the cursor left. A slight tightening of the jaw raises the cursor, and relaxing the muscle makes the cursor fall. Now the person has full control of a mouse. Take it up. But perhaps an even more amazing attribute of brain fingers is its ability to pick up and decipher the frequencies or brain waves generated by the brain. Brain fingers reads alpha and beta brain waves, which can be thought of as different states of mind. When relaxed, the brain produces more alpha waves. When the mind is mentally excited, alpha goes down and beta comes up. By mapping the electrical impulses as well as the fluctuations of alpha and beta brain waves to computer commands, brain fingers can control commercial software and games. Using brain fingers is as easy as slipping on a headband. But there's a more extreme BMI on the horizon for those willing to go under the night to get it. One person already has. Meet Matthew Nagel, the real bionic man. He might not have computer augmented super sight, but he does have a neural sensor implant and a direct connection between his brain and a computer. 
Matthew is a quadriplegic, paralyzed from the neck down. In 2004, he became the first recipient of a BMI implant called BrainGate. BrainGate actually taps in. To the real signals that orchestrate hand motions. The idea is to tap into the part of the brain that gives the commands to move your hand. This uh, reddish strip right here is called the motor cortex. This is the part of the cerebral cortex that controls movement and it's separated into subdivisions so that control of your leg is from up here control of the arm is down here and control of the face is down here. So if we're interested in signals for controlling the arm, we know right where to go. Equipped with a road map of Matthew's brain, a neurosurgeon cut a hole in his skull and implanted a tiny sensor with a hundred hair thin electrodes. The electrodes penetrated into the surface of his brain. The sensor was attached to a connector which was fastened to the patient's skull. One month after the surgery, the team held their collective breath as Matthew was plugged in for the first time. After being cut off for three years, doctors weren't sure Matthew's brain was still sending readable signals. A nearby cart held the components that would hopefully convert his brain language into something the computer could understand. When we recorded from his motor cortex and asked him, think about moving left or think about moving right, we saw that the brain activity changed. So this was a, a, a fundamental step. When we saw that, we knew that we could decode the information, interpret it as if it were hand motion, and then allow him to use his thoughts to control a computer cursor. Within days, Matthew could move the cursor around by just thinking left, right, up, and down. Next, I'm going to paint a circle. That's the best circle I can do, and I'm going to act it. The colors represent the activity changing in the various electrodes, and that twinkling patchwork of information is actually telling us something about the intention or the intended movement that the patient might want to make. Now I'm going to close the hand. Matthew has even demonstrated the ability to open and close a robotic hand just by thinking about it. Not bad, man. Not bad at all. Close. The implications are mind-blowing. A future implant could give a spinal cord injury patient control of robotic limbs. BMIs could one day be used to control super suits, giving even the average Joe superhuman strength. So you have a, for example, super strong skeleton that is outside your body that you can control, that you step into, that can allow you to lift weights that are four or five times more than you normally would be able to do. Right now, BMIs can't infuse superhuman strength, but they are making a difference to many. The people who use them have been given superpowers by opening up worlds that were once closed off. In the 1984 science fiction novel, Neuromancer, William Gibson coined the term Jack In to describe the process by which people physically connected their brains to a global computer matrix. Future Tech will return on Modern Marvels. Planning your vacation for the year 2055? Forget the moon, forget Atlantis, and come to the Red Planet. Check out the Mars Buggy ATV Park. See Olympus Mons, the largest volcano in the solar system. Visit the historic K2 site, where scientists first discovered Martian fossils. Whatever you decide to do on your Martian vacation, we promise it will be out of this world. It may seem like science fiction, but space tourism is on its way. So pack your bags. On October 4, 2004, Bert Rutan proved space was no longer the sole domain of large state-funded agencies. With financing from investor Paul Allen, Rutan's company, Scaled Composites, 
built a spaceship that rocketed its pilot 377,591 feet, around 71 miles, into the sky and into the record books. Rutan's team had built the first privately funded manned spacecraft to reach the edge of space. The flight was the second one within a week for the team, which won them the coveted Ansari X Prize, a $10 million trophy established to jumpstart the space tourism industry. Now the goal is to establish regular flights for the average person. Commercial flights could begin in just a few years. Estimated cost for a seat into space, $200,000. An orbiting space station luxury resort could be next. Two thousand four was also a banner year for NASA. Two Mars exploration rovers, Spirit and Opportunity, started exploring the Red Planet. And then there was the big announcement from President Bush. Today we set a new course for America's space program. With the experience and knowledge gained on the moon, we will then be ready to take the next steps of space exploration human missions to Mars and to worlds beyond. The president's commitment for a manned mission to Mars included building a new crew exploration vehicle, establishing an extended human presence on the moon, and eventually going to Mars. Cost estimates ranged widely from 50 to 500 billion dollars. The U.S. has been interested in the Red Planet for a long time. 1964, Mariner 4 flyby. 1975, Viking 1 and 2 missions. 1996, Mars Pathfinder. 2003, Mars Exploration Rovers. Future missions will be even more ambitious. There are a lot of problems to be solved, a lot of very exciting challenges. And this is not a time where we can arbitrarily throw out any potential answer. Five, four, three, two, one, we have ignition. One challenge is trying to reduce trip duration. Right now, the journey takes seven months, each way. Once on the Red Planet, time will also be an issue. When people are on the surface of Mars, every work hour is going to be a very precious commodity. So you certainly don't want to engage those people doing mundane things. One of the models would be that you, you actually send robots and a lot of the infrastructure that people will count on ahead of sending the people. Robots could set up prefab habitats, even before the first crew arrives. Various groups of engineers, architects, and dreamers have developed concepts for the first Martian base, including this one from the Sasakawa International Center for Space Architecture. Over my shoulder, they have a model of uh, one of the Mars base scenarios that we've, we've established that has a variety of different kinds of elements. Some of the larger ones are, are what we call pneumatic structures. Upon arrival, it will deploy, it will inflate into a larger structure. We also may look at uh, telescoping structures and they extend out. Most designs are still on the drawing board. But located in a Mars-like environment in the Utah desert, a Martian base already exists. Simulations at the Mars Desert Research Station bring space exploration down to Earth. 
The Mars Desert Research Station, or MDRS, is a simulated Mars base. So that's basically a facility where uh, engineers and scientists can test the procedures and equipment and similar things uh, in preparation for building the first actual Mars base. The MDRS was established by the Mars Society, a private organization of specialists and researchers whose goals include promoting the manned exploration and settlement of Mars. Volunteers spend two-week rotations here. Crew 37 happens to be from Georgia Tech. The, uh, the, the purpose of MDRS is to gather data and to gather experience uh, to collect lessons learned on how to operate and design such a planetary surface space. So there are many elements that you could theoretically simulate in a on a computer or you know as a separate part in a lab. But as soon as you combine everything with the human crew, that adds a, a whole another layer of complexity. And this is why it's so important to put everything together in one place, then add a crew, and then see how it works. Because the, the whole purpose of sending a crew to Mars is to have them be productive. That's right. A trip to Mars won't actually be a vacation. The crew will be busy building, exploring, and surviving. Because transportation costs are so high, the goal is to pack light and use as many Martian natural resources as possible. Oxygen can be generated from the Martian atmosphere. Uh, the Martian atmosphere consists of mainly carbon dioxide, CO2, so with the rather straightforward chemical process, if you have enough power, you can extract the O2 from the CO2. The thin Martian atmosphere is 95% carbon dioxide. Pioneer Astronautics, under contract with NASA, has already designed a solar-powered device that breaks down CO2 into carbon monoxide and oxygen. Producing water is a little trickier. Hydrogen, the primary ingredient of H2O, is hard to come by. However, there are indications that Mars was once partially covered with water. Maybe subsurface ice still exists and can be melted for human use. Finding water is important for another reason. Was there water? Is there water? If there is water, where is the water? And why the water is important is that often, uh, you know, it's, it's felt that uh, where there is water, there is some potential for life. And that, of course, is, is I think, the, the ultimate question that people uh, are intrigued by. You know, is there life out there? Robots can only do so much. A manned mission might be the only way to find out. Our civilization is currently at a level of technology where we can send humans to Mars. However, uh, the level of technology is different from having the actual equipment. Uh, that's needed all the systems and integrating those systems and making sure they actually work. So my best guess is it will take us about 10 to 15 years uh, before uh, all the systems are ready and integrated and we can uh, confidently send a crew to Mars. That's an optimistic estimate according to most experts. That's the trouble with trying to predict the future. It only takes time to be proven wrong. Forecasting the future is a strange and risky business because you hear people saying today, well, where are the flying cars? We don't see them. A lot of the things that have been forecast have in fact come true. It's just that we haven't been able to predict which ones of them will come true when. Will we be vacationing on Mars in 2060? or 2160, hard to predict. But predicting the future isn't about exactness. It's about stirring imaginations, helping us avoid impending disaster, and making for a better tomorrow. Today's fantasies are tomorrow's facts. So the sooner we get dreaming, the sooner we'll reach the stars.